My name is Tim Olison, and I'm working <coughs> with my mentor, Dr. Sandra Gray, and also with the grad student, Terrence Blue, back there. And before I get started, I'd just like to thank UT and the RU program for accepting me, and also the National, National Science Foundation for funding this project. So, now, getting in my project, what I'll be doing is um, something related to material science and calculating optical properties using uh, what's called density functional theory. But before I get into that, I just want to go through some uh, quick background from E&M, electromagnetism. The all light waves obey this um, second order partial differential equation known as the wave equation, where the V in the equation is known as is the velocity of the wave. Now, from electromagnetic theory, we can write the solution here as the uh, electric field, and we get this wave. We can write in complex form. Um, and it propagates with the velocity V equals omega over K. And in a vacuum, we can also call that C, the speed of light, which you write as omega zero over K zero. Now, when a light wave enters from a vacuum to a different medium, um, the velocity changes, but we, um, you can empirically determine that the angular frequency does not change. So therefore, by the relation of uh, omega over K, that means that the wave vector K has to change. So then, using that assumption, we can, um, in introducing the refractive index, we can get this relation down here, n equals k over k0. Then if we implement this relation into the solution to the wave equation, we, we get this solution here. But now, what we can do is we can incorporate a complex refractive index, denoted by n tilde, with real part n, which is just the refractive index we've been working with, the real part, and kappa, which is the, called the extinction coefficient or the attenuation coefficient. Um, and now doing a little bit of mathematics here, we see that we get um, this basic part, E0, with an uh, exponential with an imaginary um, argument and one with a real argument here. And this is important because when we consider the intensity of the wave, it's proportional to the modulus squared of um, the electric field. Now, if we go back and if we find the modulus of this part here, we, you can find that um, if it has an imaginary uh, argument, the modulus of that is one, so that can go away. But when we take the other part, you can just square it, and you, you're left with this factor here. And now what you have is it's dependent on kappa, the imaginary part of the complex refractive index. So as the light enters the new medium, it is dependent on uh, how far it goes in, the light actually diminishes in intensity the farther in you go. And that's how the complex refractive index is related to um, our propagation of light. Now from M and Kappa, we can determine other optical properties, such as the absorption coefficient, these classical skin depth, the surface impedance, and the reflectivity which are just given by this formula up here. And one more important thing, we can relate the complex refractive index to what's called the complex permittivity. And it's uh, related here. So complex permittivity epsilon is the same as uh, the complex refractive index squared. And we get, because this is complex, we have a real part E1 and an imaginary part E2 here. And there's similar relations here for E1 and E2 for N and kappa. They're basically N and kappa and E1 and E2 are interchangeable because of these. Now, tying this into exactly what I'll be doing is I'll be calculating the uh, dielectric function of the complex permittivity using this program called BASP. And essentially what it is is a quantum mechanical simulator and calculator which uses density functional theory. Um, Basically, what it will do is it will calculate the imaginary part of the complex dielectric function first, and then using the Kramer's Koenig relations, which are given here, you can um, then determine the real part, so the real part E1 is the imaginary part E2 there. And uh, we hope to do this for many different materials, so we can apply this and create a plot sort of like this with E1 real part E2. Imaginary part. We can do this for uh, different materials such as solar cells, or we can, in calculating the optical properties, 
we can maybe uh, find like a purely theoretical uh, way to uh, counter these properties better than going just experimentally. So, any questions? Yeah. So is this like the best way to figure out like what materials are best for whatever application you want to work on, like solar cells for example? I mean, yeah, I'm sorry. Like, you can find out optical properties of different materials. Right, yeah. so that's the best way to find out, or I mean, a good way to find out at least what materials that you should be looking at before anything else. Right, from a purely theoretical yeah. standpoint. Yeah. So I, don't know, I don't know if you know the answer to this question. I certainly don't. That's why I'm asking it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so you have this imaginary part of the dielectric constant that you calculate with the single theory, and then you put, stick that in that Kramer's chronic, and you're going to get the real part. Right. So my question is, does the calculation, that imaginary part has, can be, has different values for different frequencies, right? Right, yeah. Basically for the number of frequencies. So is that one calculation that you do to get epsilon 2 of omega using some formula, or do you have to do a separate DFT calculation for every value of omega? That's my question. Um, that's a good question. I know there's... I was looking through um, some papers, and there is a, there are some crazy looking equations which involve like the broadcast notations for like different quantum states, and I'm not sure if that's like how. Okay. Well, you'll find out. I guess you'll find out. Yeah, soon. <laughs> the equations are way okay. too complex. Okay. From what I understand. Final report. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, um, oh yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So no, it's, it's a series of calculations. You have to first optimize the structure and then do that. But you'll get it at one go as a function of frequency. So you have like a, you basically have a model, essentially, like right. an oscillator yeah. model or something right. that, that allows you to do right. all the frequencies. Yeah. Have you played with the beast yet, Vast? Yeah, um, I have. <laughs> I don't, we have, uh, Terrence has written a lot of scripts and basically mm -hmm. I don't know a lot of the uh, physics behind it, but I know how to make it run. So I'm, work I'm still working on it right mm -hmm. now. Okay. All right, then. Thanks, Dave.